I am Zarina Dimitrova, a strategic partner and mentor to businesses in the process of transformation. Join me on Grow and Learn as we explore a range of topics from personal development and career advancement to relationship building and financial management. With practical advice, inspiring stories and expert interviews, we'll give you the tools you need to thrive in every aspect of your life. Join us as we share insights and strategies that can help you achieve your personal and professional growth objectives. Today, I'm speaking to a neurosurgeon who's going to talk to us about clear facts from his experience and from his current engagement with the University of Virginia Tech, where he's teaching neuroscience. I'm welcoming Gary Simons. Well, thank you very much for having me and uh, happy holidays. (laughs) Happy holidays. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to release this for sure before Christmas. So, yeah. (laughs) All right. So let's get straight to the subject because you... um, touched previously before we started the conversation on burnout and the neurological connections of how you can behaviorally change uh, your neurology, something that a lot of people consider, especially in business, consider as a soft subject, but is actually crucial to health and well-being. Um, so I'm going to hit you straight with a, with a very interesting question. Uh I am a very strong proponent of the Silva method and I train people on the Silva method and I practice it myself. And in one of Silva's books that I've studied extensively, he actually says that um, he's had cases where more than or, or half of the brain of a person was removed and they still had complete cognitive and physical um, mobility. What is your explanation of this have you observed anything like this in your practice yeah i i actually used to do that operation um uh would be it's in very special cases of uh prolonged protracted epilepsy with seizure after seizure after seizure coming from one side of the brain and and when the seizures are doing that kind of constantly uh they jump over to the other side of the brain and get the other side of the brain involved. And usually it has to deal with uh, an injury to the brain during development in the womb. But one way or the other, one side of the brain isn't working well already and is seizing, is constantly causing seizures. Uh, And if you take that section of the brain out, including a whole hemisphere, Uh, You can stop the seizures, basically, uh, on the other side. Um, But it is kind of a specialized case because um, it all, uh, this all started even in the womb. And so one side of the brain wasn't working well right from the start. And as the brain was connecting up and and, uh, putting itself together, if you will, it made a bunch of compensatory connections on the opposite side. So if you if you take an adult and you take half the brain out, they're not going to they're not going to uh uh-huh. be as functional. Uh-huh. Um they may still be cognitively very good uh because cognition really is uh represented on both sides, but there would definitely be major uh um motor major movement uh problems with that. But with with these children who have had seizures right from the very beginning, they've kind of switched a bunch of their functions over to the other side anyway. Now, it, it, what is the meaning of that? It, it It is kind of an extreme example of how the brain, even though our brains are wired very similarly, it's, it's not static. The brain is changing uh, and it can change significantly if you start early enough, uh, but it can also change right through... Uh, you know, our 80s and 90s and hundreds, hopefully. Yeah, interesting. Well, previously there was the um, notion or the belief that uh, the um, links between our brains don't really rearrange. Now, the, the I think it's called neuroplasticity is a fixed thing. And now there's a new field of study claiming that we can rearrange these links. What What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I think there's a, there's very good evidence uh, that there is at least a certain degree of neuroplasticity that goes on all the time. I, I mean, and I mean it goes on all the time. Now, if we talk about just like we were talking about with the what we call hemispherectomies, um, 
uh, taking out half the brain. If if we're talking something major or a big stroke or a big injury to the brain, we may not be able to rewire all those functions. Um, so there is some hardwiring in there that goes on, and and it, it's fairly consistent from person to person. Um, but when you drill down to the to the cellular level, when you get down to the actual nerve cells. Uh, they're they're connected all up like wires in a computer, if you will, uh, but a very fancy computer. Uh, and uh, there's so there are billions of neurons, and they each of those each of the neurons have thousands of connections with other neurons. So there are trillions and trillions and trillions of of uh, connections that are there in the brain. And we call those connections, we call them synapses, but it's where one nerve talks to another. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way it talks to the next nerve along is at where the two meet, at what we call a synapse, the one nerve releases chemicals, we call them neurochemicals. So we, we've all heard of dopamine and serotonin and stuff like that. Well, it releases chemicals like that and they interact with what are called receptors on the other side. And then that sends a signal down the next nerve. So anyway, on a cellular level, those connections are changing all the time, all the time, one way or the other. If you And it really comes down to a use it or lose it type of uh, situation. The more you use them, mm -hmm. usually, the more they're kind of upregulated. You get more receptors. You're allowed to have those neurotransmitters interact with the receptors more. You even change what genes are being turned on and turned off, depending on how you're using these individual neurons. So the more you kind of uh, strengthen a neuronal channel, a neuronal network, the more you use it, the more likely it is to be more robust and strong because the connections get better and better and faster. And you can even grow new connections there. And the opposite is true, though. And we've seen this in chronic stress and depression and things like that, where if various networks in the brain aren't being used as much because of uh, stress and depletion and all that sort of thing, um, they will start to downgrade. They will there'll be less receptors. There'll be even less uh, areas where the the nerves can attach to one another, um, and so. Uh, you can really kind of shrink away various connections and make them much weaker just as easily as you can make ones very strong. And, and so this system is dynamic. It's going all the time, changing all the time. Not the big major networks, but where you are in the network and how strong uh, it is or isn't. Uh, so I think it's a, I, and there's really good scientific evidence for all this. I mean, it's it's robust evidence. Uh, and so I think it's really fascinating when we get to our world of, you know, trying to help people out navigating their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when <clears throat> there, there are different opinions about the reasons why people go into burnout or even what causes Alzheimer's. Um, I, I know that you've, done work on a lot of patients with Alzheimer's, so you for sure have an observation on this uh, disease for sure. Um, what do you think is the major cause of, let's start with burnout, is it because of um, people not using the right neurons or is it what some people claim uh, nutritional deficiency or uh, maybe a certain toxicity? What, what have you observed to be the major cause of burnout? Yeah, I mean, I think you could throw any of those in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think all of us live in very dynamic worlds with tons of stressors and, you know, we're polluting ourselves all the time and we're not eating right and all that sort of thing. And, you know, it, it, you you touched upon Alzheimer's, but we certainly know um, that uh, you know, the the health of our neurons, the health of our brain very much depends on lots of good things, you know, good nutrition, uh, exercise, uh, using it, thinking, challenging our brains, all that sort of thing uh, is all important, even down in the Alzheimer realms. 
Um, and so the same is going to go true for any sort of brain function that it it's multifactorial. With with burnout, you know the the, the causes are never just one thing, mm. but in general, it's a situation where um, the the system is being stressed kind of constantly, and we're not able to recharge it. We're not able to repair it as as quickly as uh, we we might be able to. So the best I. I think the best analogy I've heard of late is kind of thinking uh, about our brains as as having a, a bank, if you will, of energy. We can call it psychic energy or emotional energy, whatever you want to call it. But it's that energy that gets us up out of bed, you know, makes the coffee, gets to work, does our thing, takes care of the world, takes care of, you know, daily activities, all that sort of thing. And we all have a certain bank, a certain account of that energy. But we, but every day through our interactions with our environments or our interactions with ourselves sometimes, but one way or the other, we're, we're either making deposits, if you will, into that bank, we're putting energy into it, uh, charging it up. So uh, you hear a great song driving in the work that day or a coworker thanks you for something you did. And it's a charge, it's an energy deposit. But we also experience all sorts of withdrawals. And I, I think any of us can can rattle off a thousand withdrawals that occur in our lives. You know, somebody says something nasty to us, somebody cuts us off on the freeway or whatever. But one way or the other, these withdrawals are being made all the time. So we're making deposits, we're we're making withdrawals on that energy. And we tend to think of, of burnout as when you reach a point where you're just badly overdrawn. You you even even when you do make deposits, it's not you know it's not moving the needle much because you are so badly overdrawn. You're you you just don't have any energy. So the energy for being able to just do the common basic daily things isn't there. Uh, and so for everybody, this is going to vary. What are your stressors? What are my stressors? What are going to make the biggest withdrawals and what are going to make the best deposits for us? And that's why I can't say, oh, yes, absolutely. This is what causes causes burnout, because it's going to be a, a milieu of things. Yeah. With Alzheimer's, though, um, the the part that you mentioned about how much you, you're using your brain seems to be a bit going against the logic because I've observed cases um, or I've heard of cases of uh, friends of mine who, um, who've had relatives with Alzheimer's that were very active, that, had that were actually the opposite, that had used their brain maybe too much. Maybe they've burned some of these neuro connections. I don't know. Have you had any of these? Okay. No, I would I, I would argue that you know we've got to be careful of anecdote too, right? In that um, eating well, uh, staying active, and learning, and uh, you know exercising, they're all. If you look at thousands of thousands of people, statistically, they are protective against Alzheimer, but it's not one to one. Mm -hmm. So you could be, you know, you could be a college professor reading, you know, reading ancient script every day and still get horrible Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's not a vaccination against the disease, if you will. But over big populations, it certainly pans out that it is far better to stay intellectually active uh, than not and physically active as well. Mm -hmm. When it comes to new neuroscience now, what is your engagement with the University of Virginia Tech? Are you teaching neuroscience there? Are you doing some research? Yeah, my, um, my research days are over. I, I retired from doing surgery a couple of years ago. Um, and so now what I do is teach undergrads neuroscience. And I also teach medical students uh, neuroscience, both that uh, both at Virginia Tech. And, you know, we go into all sorts of things, but basically it's uh, in the realm of what we call clinics, meaning, you know, diseases and how we treat the diseases and things like that. Mm -hmm. Does it have to do with the uh, psychological impacts on neuroscience? 
We do definitely uh, get into that for a couple of reasons. One is uh, I think it's a mistake to treat the physical ailments, if you will, of, of the brain uh, differently from uh, the psychological. I mean, it's all the same organ. It, it, it doesn't change the way it works for one or the other. Uh, and so uh, I think it's really important to include both. And at Virginia Tech has a really robust um, neuroscience school. It's a, the Virginia Tech School of Neuroscience, and they have a big arm of behavioral science for sure, uh, behavioral neuroscience for sure. But I'm more in, I am definitely more in the clinical realm, but we definitely touch on psychological illnesses. And then really for the last 15, 20 years, I've been deeply involved in the world of burnout. Um, and uh, so we spent a fair amount of time talking about burnout and and how to hopefully prevent it and how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go into the topic of burnout a little bit. We don't need to, you know, go very deep, but you mentioned some of the causes of burnout. Let's uh, talk about the way a person may realize themselves they have a burnout because very often people don't know until they're unable to function. So what are some signs that you can catch yourself with? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great question. I'm going to give you a little background in how I got involved in it. I got involved in it because I ran our neurosurgery department um, and then I had 11 surgeons, a whole bunch of residents, uh, 11 PAs, bunch of you know nurses and support staff. It was a fairly big department. And uh, we, I think we were doing a good job taking care of patients, uh, but we were getting complaints all the time about people on our team. Um, and, and the complaints, again, they weren't professional in terms of are you able to do good surgery or are you making the right decisions for your patients? They were just being, and I say they, I think I'm included, but uh, we uh, were just being jerks. We were not nice. We were causing people to feel bad about themselves and we were keep making people cry. And, you know, we were always just snapping and barking and, uh, and you know, just really taking advantage of people and stuff just to get the job done, if you will. And it reached such a toxic point where I figured I had to do something uh, to try to get us back on a good track. And I stumbled on the idea of could this be burnout? Because if if you you know if you look at the uh, the classic definitions of burnout, or you put everybody through a burnout assay, like the Maslach burnout assay, uh, you know they might come out of it looking pretty good, and yet. I would argue that the team was burnt out. And um, and so uh, the way I got involved was I started working on the burnout and happened to, happened to run into really a world expert on physician burnout. Uh, his name's Wayne Sotil. And he and I worked on the team for a, a couple of years. But the long and short of it is by addressing it as burnout, um, there was such a transformation. It was almost miraculous to me. The, I was, before we started this, I was getting 30, 40, 50 formal complaints about our team a month mm -hmm. and having to deal with that. And, and within a few months of getting this going, at least it took a while, but after several months of, of working on this, the complaints dropped to zero. And all of a sudden, our team was getting awards all across the, the system and all for being so helpful and being wonderful and all this sort of thing. So this is a long answer to your very pointed question. And that is, I think it becomes very hard for people to recognize it in themselves. And it doesn't have to fit a classic pattern. The classic pattern is, you know, it's difficult for you to get up and get moving. There's just no energy to do your daily things and you you lose your empathy and you become nihilistic mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Well, our guys weren't like that at all. They were still high energy. They were doing millions of operations and all that, but their personalities started to drag. So they were able to hold up their professional sides but their personalities started to crash. Wow. And I think that, you know, for this reason, and, and again, nobody was recognizing it in themselves, but if you start 
uh, pushing them on various questions like, you know, what do you like at home? What are you doing when you get home? Are you interacting with your family? Are you doing fun, fun things? Or are you just crashing in front of the TV and drinking or something? Um, what we found is just all sorts of idiosyncrasies started coming out uh, in our people. So yeah, I mean, we may be able to recognize it as an overall depletion in our energy and, and like I said, a nihilism and, and a lack of empathy, but that's hard to recognize in yourself. And sometimes you have to get other people to say, wait a minute, you're not the same person that, you know, I've been with for the last several years. You just, you know, you, you, you are, I've, you're, a blank slate or you're, you know, nasty or you're uh, lost all your interest in everything that you used to be interested in. I know myself, for example, I don't know if you can see in the room, but, you know, there's instruments in there and I love playing guitar and banjo and that sort of thing. And uh, I know when I'm depleted, I stop playing those things. It's actually a sign to me that, wait a minute, you better you better start working on yourself because you are losing interest in things that, you know, really generally, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, fantastic. I mean, fantastic uh, explanation of the, um, of the state of burnout. And so once you acknowledge this in, in your department, what were, were some of the steps that you took to address it within those few months? Yeah. So, uh, well, to be honest with you, we kind of experimented with our team and uh, um, it, we eventually wrote wrote it up into three books on the subject and all. Um, but we cycled through, I don't know, it must have been 70 or 80 different types of exercises that we would have the team do uh for a week or two and then they would bring us back feedback on you know how it made them feel did did they notice anything different uh and that sort of thing so i'm not going to rattle off 70 or 80 uh, different techniques for you but i'll give you a couple uh or a few of the ones that uh we think are really important so to get get back to your previous question um one of the one of the first steps i would argue one of the first steps is to develop a sense of what we call it self compassion but it's really an emotional intelligence about yourself and you know so many of us in this hectic you know wildly spinning world we are so externally oriented. We got to get the job done. We got to get the kids taken care of. We got to do this. We got to do that. And we're constantly focused on external uh, things. In, me in medicine, it was really easy because you're always focused on the patient and their out outcomes. Um, and it's, it's even to the point where you feel guilty if you give yourself your own health, either mental or physical, uh, even a minute's notice. But we would argue that that's one of the first things you need to do. Periodically, you need to sit down and take stock of where am I? What am I at? You know, how do I feel? And what's what's lifting me up? What's bringing me down? Are things going the way I would want them to? Am I the person that I would want to be for my family, for my workmates, all that sort of thing? And, you know, take down, write it down, think about it, give give it some real thought uh, if you've got really close people who you trust, ask them too. you know, get their input on where you're at. Um, but it's awfully hard to address this if you don't understand it in yourself, just precisely your question. Mm -hmm. If you're not seeing it in yourself, how do you take care of it? So step, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, and especially I have the feeling that sometimes it's it's a chronic burnout. It's not something that happens abruptly, like that you can notice, but it's something that's been taking years to uh, to um to show itself yeah that's a fantastic point because you know it's just creeping its way in there right so yeah. how are you going to notice it and the other thing that we always tell people it's not black and white it's not binary it's probably cycling like this all the time but mm -hmm. if it's cycling downwards you know eventually it reaches that point like i said where you can't recharge it even if you do the things that are fun for you even if you pick up the banjo it's not working you know mm -hmm. so 
uh, step number one, self-compassion, really get to know yourself and what, where you're at and where you want to be, uh, and, and set up positive goals for your life. You know, these are the places I would like to be. What direction am I going? Am I getting closer or further away? That sort of thing. Step number two, which is part and parcel with it, um, is self-care. And that is, you're not going to fix it if you don't do something to fix it. It's not going to happen spontaneously. You're not going to take a pill and it's going to go away. You actually have to actively address it. And one of the hard things about it is because burnout involves energy depletion, you've, you've got to invest some energy up front to get started. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't, you know, and, and therefore it can be hard. It can be hard to take that first step uh, to start making it better. So uh, these are the, the two, you know, fundamental principles you got to get started on self-compassion, self-care. And we have a, we have an axiom that goes with that. And that is no guilt ever for self-compassion, self-care, because we tend to feel guilty when we do it. And then from there, you can get into all sorts of exercises. So I'll give you a, a couple quickies. I promise uh, to be quicker on it. Um, but uh, one is what what we call um, uh, I'm going to block on my, on my formal terminology for it. But one is to um, overlook and and discuss your stressors. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Because you got to be careful. What we don't want is. Uh, to have, let's say something goes wrong with a coworker at work today and you get home and you say, ah, she's had a bad day at work. And then you get into, uh, you know, he drank my coffee. Then I said something about it. Then he said this. Then I said this. Then he said this. Then all you're doing is reliving it. Mm -hmm. But what we want to debriefing your stressors is the word I was looking for. But anyway, what you can do periodically, if there are things that are really getting under your skin, if you have somebody trusted that you can discuss these things with, a coworker or a spouse, a friend, um, it's it's good every so often to say, hey, this thing happened today and it really bothers me that it's still bothering me. It's bothering me that it's under my skin. I don't know why I can't let it go. So now what you're doing is you're talking about your response. You're not talking about all the nitty gritty of the incident. You're talking about well, how did I respond? Could I have responded better? Mm -hmm. uh, could I have responded in a more adaptive way? Uh, you know, that would lead to a better relationship out there. And and it's interesting. I'll give you one example. We, we When we would do this with our team, um, you know, somebody brought in the fact that uh, when we dealt with abused children, um, they would get so angry at the parents. And they said, you know, I, I, I just want to throttle the parent for, for harming the children. And, and, you know, the whole group was able to say, yeah, I mean, I, 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 dealing with this, it's a sad and tragic and awful thing. But what I'm feeling is anger and hostility. And how do I, you know, how do I still be a good doctor and, and do everything I need to do when I'm in that mode? And it was a tremendous discussion. And, I, you know, you don't necessarily come up with blinding solutions, um, but just getting it out there. And, and it, it will take a lot of the power out of the negativity of it. So every so often debriefing some bad stressors focused on your response rather than the nitty gritty is a great thing to do. And then I would couple that. And there's a, you know, an exercise that we should, we should do regularly, all of us should do. And that we call harvesting our uplifts. And that is simply, at least again, we would go through our days and we, we actually train our brains to look for bad. That was my business. I got to, I, if an operation goes well, I don't sit there and high five. I think, okay, what can go wrong now? What's going to mess this operation up after it went so well in the operating room? If it gets infected, it gets a pulmonary embolus, it gets this, it gets that. It can, it can turn everything to crap. And so I, I, you know, my brain was always searching for the negative side of things. And you can bring that to home, you know, very easy. 
So one of the things that we do is tell people uh, either with a piece of paper or with your phone about your days, write down five things a day that went well, that brought a smile on your face, that made you feel happier, that made you feel more connected, just just positive things that happen in your day and write them down. And when you get home that night, just before you go to bed, review them and remind yourself that good things are happening around you day to day. Well, going back to kind of the neuroscience side of all this we were talking about, at first you got to kind of force yourself to do this. Mm -hmm. You're not going to remember, you're not going to think about it. You just, okay, I got to go five, five things. I'll, you know, it, it's like a homework assignment. All right, I'll find those five <laughs> things. But after a week or two, your brain starts getting trained and, and you start, all of a sudden, you're noticing these things spontaneously. Hey, that nurse just thanked me. You know, hey, I got a hug from this patient's family. Mm -hmm. And and things that you would just blow through and not even notice, all of a sudden you're logging in. And therefore your days become more positive. You're making more deposits in that bank of energy of yours. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, the fact that these people all worked in a team and they were all given the same assignments, they were all dealing with the same problem simultaneously, do you think this helped in some way? Because, you know, they had the support system also. Yeah, what a wonderful question. Uh, this is hard to go it alone. Yeah. Uh, you can go it alone. You can do all these exercises we talked about, but you got to kind of almost have a make-believe friend. You know, you you're going to have to be able to uh, get it out there, either journal it, you know, you could journal it or you could speak it to, uh, uh, you know, your computer, you could podcast it if you want. I don't know. But, you know, it's it's much, much better if you have an environment of trusted people that you can you can uh, enter these discussions with. And, and we had some very strong ground rules of that. We did these sessions really every week uh, for, for a few years. But um, uh, we had some ground rules that, for example, what we talked about in there uh, stayed in there and that there was no belittling of each other. So if somebody shares something that they find embarrassing, it's not going to help if you all make fun of the person, you know, from that point on and all. Um, what we found, you know, originally, this was this was a group of high end uh, healthcare providers, you know, who were very cynical. And they're like, ah, and because I was a boss, at least I was able to say, you will come to these sessions. Um, and so they had to, uh, but they found every excuse not to at first. But uh, like I said, it was miraculous. The reason why I'm kind of a, a you know, proselytize about it is that, you um, Within, I don't know, six months, everybody made it. You didn't have to tell people to come. The room was packed with our team. And as you say, having that team, and we already depended on each other very much in the clinical sense, right? You know, we had to trust each other in terms of you're taking care of my patients, I'm taking care of yours. Um, so I think that helped a lot. So we do feel that if, you know, it's really good if you can establish a what we would call a resilience group. Um, you could be doing this with a spouse, a loved one, a partner, friends. Um, coworkers often are easy because again, you have shared experiences. Um, but they've they've got to buy into it eventually, right? Uh, because it's going to be very much built on trust and you're going to discuss your responses and how you reacted and what made you feel good and what made you feel bad. And and that's not easy for people. Yeah. Is there a way you are uh, maybe packaging this methodology that you've applied for, for future uses by medical professionals? And the reason why I'm asking, uh, Gary, is because I've actually spoken to relatives of surgeons and of other people that, that have participated in the small uh, after-work groups of surgeons. And it usually end these evenings end up with a lot of alcohol and, you know, <laughs> them spilling up their um, sorrows of losing a patient or things like that. I mean, there needs to be an outlet for all of this. Although you mentioned your 
you could be uh, tough skinned at times and uh, surgeons are, and doctors are known to be uh, tough skinned because they have to you have to you know kind of you you know best you need you need to go through the day without becoming too empathic but it it still creeps in deep down inside so you need an outlet for this more than probably other professions have you the uh, thought of or maybe are you doing something like packaging of this methodology that, that you've already experienced to provide it to surgeon groups medical doctors other medical doctors yeah absolutely um you know and again thanks for the amazing questions uh and uh, they're such good questions they make me ramble on so you gotta for forgive me you know when i keep uh talking away but everything was um, on point and very relevant well good but uh <laughs> I, you know, for example, I I just came out with a novel and it's about a neurosurgeon who's clearly burnt out and he begins to see ghosts. Uh, but we we do touch in the book on a lot of things you just talked about, about uh, the constant stress, the fact that they may look tough on the outside, uh, but you're taking hits all the time. I'm going to give you one vignette on this. It's not out of the novel. It's out of my real life. But I... I saw more tragedy and more awfulness uh, than you can imagine. I mean, it was just every day, you know, and every night on call, several horrible car accidents and gunshot wounds and all that sort of thing would be coming in. And, you know, everybody's lives were being turned upside down. And I felt like I sailed right through it. It was very rare where I felt like it really hit um, because, I, you know, I guess I was of the mindset that if I, I let it get in there, then how do I move on to the next one? Right. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped operating, one of the things I noticed is that I cry all the time. Now, I don't mean, you know, because my because my toast fell on the floor. But, you know, if I'm if I'm watching a movie that has some, you know, sentimentality to it, all of a sudden I feel tears streaming down my face. I'm like, what is this? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think what. What I'm saying is, I think that stuff was logging in all the time. You just mm -hmm. you're just blocking it off. Um, but uh, to to get back to your very pointed question, um, we I, we wrote three books on this. So there are three three books available. One is neurosurgery oriented. One is to physicians. So when we read the neurosurgery one, they said, well, it's not just neurosurgeons who burn out, you know, as doctors. And so we wrote one oriented to doctors. And then people said, well, it's not just doctors in medicine who are burning out. So we wrote one oriented to all healthcare providers. And then people started saying, well, it's not just, you know, people in healthcare burn out. We said, wait, that's enough. We, we've, we've gone as far as we can uh, take it with our expertise. So we do have books. Um, I was doing a lot of talks and then COVID hit and it's kind of been slow since, you know, the, you know, just going out and giving talks. So I've been doing it more locally than anything. And of course we do it in our national meetings and, and stuff like that. Uh, I started, uh, I, I thought of doing my own podcast, but I, I think it's too hard work. You much uh, kudos to you for being able to uh, sustain it. But I started making little three minute uh, chops uh, that I started putting on TikTok and I'm going to keep doing that in the resilience field and stuff like that. So yeah, we're, we're trying to get the message out through multiple ways. Mm -hmm. But is there like a, a packaged system uh, apart from what is already in the books that is split in three parts, like a system of how to deal with burnout in a medical setting? In medical uh, setting? Not of my doing. Uh, and I, I think it's a good question. I don't think... Like in the United States, it is it is definitely being recognized. Unfortunately, there's a lot of, as we talked about, cynicism. Um, and and so even though systems recognize it, they'll they'll give a, you know, they'll give a lecture or they'll bring a bunch of puppies in for people to pet, you know, once a year, and they'll say, okay, we're doing what we need to 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 fight burnout where um, I remember in one of your YouTube videos, you were talking about the need for consistency of message and consistency of effort. And I would say this very much goes for burnout. 
particularly in those early days of trying to tackle it, uh, it would be that, you know, it, it's good to be doing positive oriented exercises daily. And, and, you know, we go right back down to the neuroscience. We need to start grooving the neural networks in our brain that normally are tied into our reward centers and all that are, that are saying, here, this is good for you. This is making you happy. This is giving you energy. And we, but, but if you, if you just go see a lecture, it's not going to do that. You, you've got to kind of work on whatever works for you on a daily basis. Where can people find you? What's your TikTok? I think I checked it, but I forgot the name. It, it was very interesting, the, the shorts that you're making. What is the TikTok handle? Oh, geez. It must be my name, Gary <laughs> Gary R. Simmons, usually. I, the best thing yes. to do is... To Gary Simons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or or to go just to my website. Uh, my website has all the links. So my website is my name, Gary R. Simons, uh, dot com. It's real easy. Mm -hmm. And people can uh, find your books there as well? Yeah, the, the books are easy to trace uh, that way and links to where they're sold. And they're all sold on, you know, the typical outlets of Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and independent bookseller, you, you know, all that sort of thing. Tell us a bit about the books. We didn't touch on that at all. What are the books about? I mean, the, the first three are more professional. What is the, um, the fiction one about? Yeah, and and by the way, even with the, um, even with the uh, nonfiction books, we tried to make them very readable and very short clips. Uh, we, one of the critiques, uh, frankly, was that we made it kind of oversimplified, and you know our response to that is. If we made it super complicated, full of a bunch of psychological jargon and stuff, we were afraid that people would just turn it off. Mm -hmm. So it's all very practical. Here's something you could try. Here's a question for you to think about. Here's something you can discuss with, you know, a group or a partner or whatever. So there, and, and like the middle book, it's called The Thriving Physician. What we did there is we went through, I don't know, 60, 70 typical stressors that a physician might face. And then the rest of the chapter is, well, how might you deal with this stressor? What may might turn it into a growth experience rather than you know, a destructive experience? So then the novel, I, I, I always wanted to write a book about what modern neurosurgery really is like, what that world is like. Uh, because it is, it's a foreign world to most people and it's pretty heart-rendering. But, uh, and so originally, you know, I was going to write this eyes wide open account of it. And, and, and I, I thought, ah, it's just going to sound like another textbook. Uh, so I, I wondered if I could create a novel centered around that world, where I was hoping, you know, really to put the reader right into the operating room, have the brain bleeding on them and them trying to figure out what the heck they're going to do. Um, and uh, so I came up with this idea of a neurosurgeon who's overworked, really a workaholic, clearly is burned out, uh, but doing his job and doing it well, who then begins to see things that aren't there. And at first he thinks they're hallucinations, uh, but then he convinces himself that they're ghosts. And there, and this his his professional world and his and his home life start to come apart. Uh, as he sees more and more of these ghosts. And hopefully the readers will question, you know, is he losing his mind or are the ghosts real? And what's what's going on here? And where will it end? Uh, so uh, that's what it's about. Uh, and hopefully okay. it's, it's done well. I mean, it's, it's getting good reviews and people seem to enjoy it. So, uh, and I really want, the, the other thing I really wanted was, uh, I was hoping people would you know, want to discuss it read it and say, hey, Simmons, why in the world did you do this? Or what What were you going after with this and all? Mm -hmm. This one is called uh, Death's Pale Flag. It is called Death's Pale Flag, yeah. which is a quote from uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh -huh. Gary, I truly enjoyed this conversation, for real. Thank you so much <laughs> for everything that you shared, for all the tips for burnout, for, you know, describing so realistically the the life and the environment in which a brain surgeon works and that was i think you managed to immerse immerse everyone now in a 
in the environment and um, to let us feel with you what it was like. Thank you so much for all of that. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a true pleasure. Thank you for listening to Grow and Learn. We hope that you found our podcast informative, engaging, and inspiring. Our mission is to help you keep growing and learning, and we hope that our conversations and insights have provided you with practical advice and useful perspectives. If you're looking for personalized support and guidance to help you achieve your personal or professional growth objectives, I offer a range of services to help. As a trusted management partner and mentor, I work with businesses in the process of transformation, looking for new streams of business, as well as M&A. With an extensive professional network of experts and mentors, I can bring on board the right person or team based on the specific needs of the company I'm working with. To learn more about the services I offer and how I can help you achieve your goals, visit my website at growandlearn.org. You can also reach out to me via email or social media. I'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this episode of Grow and Learn, please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review. Your feedback is important to us and it helps us to continue to create content that is relevant and valuable to our listeners. Thanks again for listening and we look forward to sharing more insights and perspectives with you in the future.